Um, brilliant. Thank you very much. I've got to crack on so we don't, so just don't worry about rushing to your seats. That's fine. Um, those people who um, think, well, what's this guy who's come from Butterfly Conservation doing talking about verges? It's because I've had a 25-year career at Dorset County Council. And during that time, I was the county ecologist, and so had all the frustrations that you've heard from, from others today, from Norfolk and Suffolk, of why we, you try and do something, and then those damn engineers get in the way and ruin it, or somebody's moan is at the wrong time. And who gets the complaints? It's the ecologists. Magic. At some point in that 25-year career, things changed, and that was called austerity. And, and suddenly we had to make huge budget savings, and I found myself in charge of the whole of the green space management across the county council. And that included road verges. And for once in my life, I had the chance to control budgets and staff to make the changes across the county as the ecologist as you would wish to see. So what I want to do today is just to give you that sort of little bit of the history of, of, of why I think it's really important we're all in this room this afternoon and why I think we are going to make a difference. I want to follow on with that theme of optimism. You should walk away from my talk with some optimism. And I will also give you a couple of local examples of how things can change. Right. Anybody guess where that bypass is? Anybody? Ashby. Ashby, Leicestershire. Okay probably one amongst very, very many. It's a bit like a Tesco's car park. You can't really identify where it is. It's incredibly boring. Okay, so the landscape there has been designed using the standard landscape specification of topsoil and amenity grass and some trees in tubes. And do we call that wildlife? Do we think that's of any value to wildlife? Not really. It's probably of marginal value. Right, so what we need to do is to work out how we create that. And as I always bang on about, it's soil fertility. Soil fertility is the key to biodiversity of grasslands in northwestern Europe. That's all you need to know. If we take an ecological approach to grass verge management, which is what I did at the county council, is that there are some win-wins to gain. Because if we can control the amount of grass that grows in the first place, we'll have less to cut. And guess what? If you've got less to cut, in theory, it should cost you less. And then you can spend more time doing other interesting things like mending rights of way or leading guided walks or whatever. And intrinsically, as night follows day, biodiversity increases, as Mark has already said, as more species are able to thrive in poorer soils. So that's the ecological approach that I got instilled as policy adopted by Cabinet at Dorset County Council. Everything else follows from that. So get in at the highest level and make the change. So those drivers, austerity for me, but these days, increasing biodiversity, that's very much on Highways England's agenda, enhancing biodiversity, net gain by 2050. Carbon sequestration, there's an awful lot of stuff going to happen over carbon sequestration, and permanent grasslands are very important stores of carbon beneath the ground, and the more species rich, the greater the store. So there's a win-win to be gained in carbon sequestration. And there's also that res response to public concern. The public are pretty sick of seeing a lot of verge management going on, and they want something better. And that's you here and me banging on to our councillors that we want to change. Right. So what does soil fertility do to soil? Well, it's pretty obvious. On the left is... Um, these, this is just not far from my house where, um, in Weymouth, where my ex-engineering colleagues ran out of topsoil on the right and just sowed the amenity grass over whatever they had. And that tells you everything you need to know about the impact of soil fertility on grass growth. You know it, but there it is in green and white. Um, on the left, it needs cutting. This is end of April. And you can also see the biodiversity that's there, two dandelions. Look on the right, it doesn't need cutting, and look what's there, a load of daisies. I'm not saying that's brilliant wildlife, but it illustrates the ecosystem that we're working with. If you reduce fertility, you increase the space for germination, and that is what is key to encouraging wildflowers in the environment. It's as simple as that. So, the very best time 
to incorporate low fertility is in construction. And that I had the huge pleasure of being able to influence on the Weymouth Relief Road back in 2009 when construction started, but I'd been start I think I started work on the scheme in 1998. That's the life of a county ecologist. You start 20 years before anything actually happens. Anyway, um, so 2009 to 2011, this was constructed in a, a range of different geologies, but from a, from a wildflower point of view, chalk, limestone, sands, clays, really, really important stuff. And that means into the landscape specification, you say no topsoil or very, very little. So that was the maximum amount of topsoil I would allow anywhere near any road verge on any decent slope on the Weymouth Relief Road, 15 millimetres. And if you look at the standard specifications, it says 150 or 300 or 450 mil of topsoil. No, 15 maximum. And that, have I had my time again, I wouldn't even have allowed 15. Because bare mineral soil is actually bare mineral, bare rock is really, really good. It's the base plan. There was no topsoil when the ice retreated, was there? It was whatever was there left when the ice retreated and everything's formed on top of it. So why do we insist on specifying this stuff? Can we just stop? So, 15 mil of topsoil. Then, hand sewn onto that, a very basic chalk grassland seed mix. Um, some of those commercially bought from seed suppliers not very far from this part of the world, um, and the rest of it hand collected by me. You don't need much seed. You are allowing nature to take its course and to do the work for you. So there's a list of whatever it is, 20 odd species. Um, and, um, and the effect, after 18 months after sowing, Ooh, it's quite good, isn't it, really? <laughs> kind of surprised me, too. But then it... Oh, thank you. Um, but there's one species dominating there, and that's kidney vetch. And kidney vetch is very important from a butterfly point of view, but let's put that to one side. Kidney vetch is an important plant because it's a pioneer species. So if you want to create an effect the day a scheme opens, put kidney vetch into the mix on bare ground because it will provide you with green cover if you have to open the scheme outside the, sh outside the main summer months and bright yellow flowers throughout the summer. So kidney vetch is a really important seed. Trust your ecologists to get the specification of your bare ground correct and you will provide something very impressive, magnificent. So that was 2013. What about now? Well, that's what it looks like now. The, 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 the habitat is gradually heading towards something like a, um, a, a chalk grassland. And, and at the moment, you can see there is mainly horseshoe vetch and grasses and herbs and the rest of it. There's still a huge amount of bare ground in amongst that. And last year, I got another botanical survey done there. So we've had one in 2013, one in 2019. Remember, we sowed just 25 species, we're now up to 141 species on that, on that site. So there's a lot of natural colonization. And as time goes on, don't worry about what Ellenberg N means, but basically we're looking at the, 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 the uh, propensity of flower species to really like high nitrogen or not high nitrogen. And in chalk grasslands, it's the not high nitrogen. And we're, start, we're gaining many more species on that site which are dependent upon low nitrogen status, and we're starting to lose those which are dependent upon high nitrogen status. So effectively, the, the land is successing towards chalk grassland. How long do we think it's going to be before we get to the point at which we've got a national vegetation classification, CG3? How about 30 years? Now, I think if we were specifying that, we'd want CG3 within five or 10. No. Please allow these sites to success from bare ground through to something interesting over a very, very long period. And that has two very important points. One is it creates the bare ground, which invertebrates like so much. And the second is you don't need to look after it. Management costs are very, very low. And that's really important because management is what takes up an awful lot of time and resources. Right, there's another one, a bit further down the road. That was another little bit of verge. Doesn't it look fantastic? 
And now we'll do the kidney vetch bit, is the small blue butterfly is a very important species in this country, but one that is in pretty serious decline, still quite widespread, throughout um, most of southern England, scattered populations, all the way up to Sutherland and eastern Scotland. So, um, but the reason it's in decline is because we've stopped seeing kidney vetch in our wider countryside. As soon as you put kidney vetch out there, the species turns up. So even before I took that photograph in 2013, the blue butterfly had turned up from probably four miles away in 2012. So even where there were very few plants in flower, the butterfly turned up from quite some distance. Don't think that just because an invertebrate is small that it's incapable of getting from one site to another. So the stepping stones here don't need to be that close to make it work. And, and in terms of numbers, well, they're just going from strength to strength. So very low at first, and now the numbers on the transect, on the um, butterfly monitoring transect that we're running on the site, are extremely high, probably as good as any other site in the country for this butterfly. So here's something where we've created, well, it's certainly of regional importance, some might say it was of national importance, this population of small blue on a road verge. Boom. That was pretty easy, wasn't it? Why can't we do that everywhere? That's the challenge, and that should be your challenge every time there's a road scheme that comes up in any soil, limestone, sand, chalk, breckland. Why can't we do that there too? Right. It's not just small blues. Um, we've, we've seen Adonis blue arrive very quickly. Now that only had a mile to come, so I'm not surprised. Much more surprising, Chalk Hill blue. The nearest populations in any reasonable shape in Dorset are about 11 miles away on Portland. And it's taken eight years to get there. But it's arrived. And it's now there, and it seems to be doing OK. My guess is, at some point or other, we will end up, well, maybe not like the Thurfield Heath populations in this part of the world, where you get thousands of them, but you never know, is that overall that habitat is in good shape to accept and to allow Chalkhill Blues to thrive. And other species too. Wall, that's a, a rare and declining species. That's on there. Marbled whites, hundreds of them, thousands of them. And then, because I'm a moth person, then six, six belted clearwing. That's a lovely species on, on um, kidney vetch and horseshoe vetch and bird's foot trefoil. And overall, you know, that's my motto. If you build it, they will come. If you get the specification right, you are pretty much guaranteed to be able to encourage vast amount of wildlife onto your site. So, in the last 10 years, 30 species of butterfly recorded on those slopes. That's about seven hectares of ground. That's over half the UK list of butterflies in 10 years. Come on, we can do it, can't we? We really can rebuild biodiversity. We should think of road verges as a really important opportunity to bring back wildlife into this country. And the numbers, well, the numbers are going to fluctuate, aren't they, with the seasons? My guess, after this appallingly wet autumn and winter, and probably heading into spring, the numbers might just be a bit depressed. But nothing's going to change to that site. It's still in perfectly good working order. So whatever happens, whatever the weather throws, at some point, the numbers will bounce back. Now, other things we managed to do. We managed to include grazing unit on the main slopes. So on at least half of that, so about three hectares of ground, had uh, grazing fences on highway land. Now, that's something that is a challenge, to be able to fence highway land and incorporate uh, sheep in. But we've done it. We've done it because we thought we'd get away with it. And we have. Nobody's taken us to court for fencing against highway land, for, for impinging the rule for pass and repass. No, 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 no. Nobody's done that. And that's because everybody can see the benefit. So sometimes you have to kind of stretch the rules a bit, step outside the box, do something a little bit unconventional. What I would say is, well done to Highways England's designers for the A303 scheme. If that gets funding next month, for better or worse, then they've included grazing on the highway verges there, based on the Weymouth scheme. So we will see what's possible. But that's Highways England saying, hmm, that sounds like a cheap way of maintaining our verges. Why don't we do that too? So, just a little bit on net savings. Not having to smear 150 mil or 300 mil of topsoil on those verges saved, on that Weymouth scheme, over a quarter of a million pounds. That has to be true for most other schemes where you're carting topsoil around. 
and notifiable weeds. There's no ragwort and thistle if there's no topsoil. That's where the seed sources come. There's no seed in bare rock, so you don't have to do any spraying or pulling or whatever. Just let nature take its course. And annual maintenance drops from quite a lot to almost nothing. This is a very, very simple prescription for all new highway designs, and I plead, plead anybody doing that to get it right. And around the country, that's beginning to happen. Um, so, which bypass now? Melton Mowbray. Okay, Melton Mowbray. The parts of the slopes there have had no topsoil and have been sown with greater and common bird's foot trefoil, specifically for dingy skipper butterflies. Congratulations, Leicestershire County Council, for doing just that. The message is out there, and others need to follow suit. Right, now let's have a look at a little bit of uh, something slightly different. So here's an accident black spot in Dorset. This is one of our worst in our county. The left-hand verge gets mown, or used to get mown, eight or nine times a year because when cars approach the junction that you can see on the left, they can't see over the top of the grass. Very, very common issue that faces local government all the time, and me as the manager of those verges. I said, right, let's dig up the verge, take it away, and put down some chalk. Let's retrofit that low fertility approach. What did that cost? Five grand. Well, as a minor capital work from a highways budget, trivial. It will take a long time to repay that if you work out the cash cost of how much verge management is actually required. But in reality, it was a very quick scheme to do, just, a, just 10 days' work and, and, and easy to operate. And now you go back there and look at it. That was last September, October. And to be honest, no management required at all. So you've gone from eight or nine mows a year to none, zero, nada, nothing to do on that. And that will be true probably for the next two or three years. And then maybe it'll need one quick trim. So this low fertility approach is something that brings that win-win of uh, having to, you know, basically reducing your maintenance costs, cutting them out altogether, and is really powerful. And then, of course, you just chuck a few wildflower seeds on there, and the natural environment gets on with the rest. Right, local one. Here's for spotted moth, and this is in uh, Crishall in Essex, um, where road verges actually do hang on to some really important populations of rare butterflies, moths, plants, beetles, all sorts. And um, here, this species of uh, four-spotted moth is um, it's a very low, right at the northern limit of its uh, range in this country, and, and is a basically sort of East Anglia, Kent, just into, uh, into Dorset, but a, a rarity, day-flying moth, and the caterpillars feed on field bindweed. Now, field bindweed is a pretty common roadside plant, but it could be made a whole lot commoner by disturbance. And you can see here in the, um, next to the fencing how much that ground has been disturbed. So this is kind of a sort of thin, breckish-like soils, uh, which, which uh, respond very well to disturbance. It increases the field bindweed and increases the opportunity for this moth fall spotted to survive. So that's brilliant. Next is, um, this is Kia's work on the A11. Now, that's kind of gone into a at the minute, but this is a trial that Keir were able to undertake on the A11, which uh, you've heard already about the mowing of the one 1.2 meter strip, swath strip next to the road verge. Beyond that, you end up with this wider strip between, uh, uh, you know, between there and the highway edge, which gets a mow, what, once every three years, possibly once every five. Now, rather than mowing on Breckland soils, Breckland is this wonderful habit. I don't need to talk to you about Breckland, do I? You know, I love coming over here because of the phenomenal diversity of annual and, and uh, uh, porciennial plants are here, the rare moths and beetles and flies that are associated with that habitat. Amazing. But if those verges just simply get mown once every three years, those plants never get a chance to express themselves, and then the moths are never there either. So Kia kindly went out there and did a trial of rotivating. And the idea is to rotivate every maybe three years on sections. And what have we got? 11 kilometers of the A11 to work with here. Wouldn't that be fantastic if that scheme could be rolled out so that rather than that once every three year mowing, you get a sequential rotivating of the road verges to encourage the annual plants. And what annual plants are we after? Well, 
it could be a whole range of things, but here's flixweed, which is, um, well, it's, it's actually not really a native. It's, um, it's, a, it's an ancient plant of this country, but, um, but it's very special from a moth's point of view because it holds on to the grey carpet moth. Now, that really is the most attractive photo I can find of the grey carpet. Um, it, it goes along with the drab looper for being, you know, very interesting but slightly dull-looking moths, I'm afraid. Um, but the caterpillar, uh, which you can see in the lower left slide, is of the um, grey carpet feeds on the seeds of flixweed. So this rotivating is likely to produce uh, substantial areas of flixweed and really encourage this moth. This moth only occurs in the Breck in Suffolk. So it's a very important species in this country. And, and Kia, well, and now Kia's successors, as in High Res England, um, have the opportunity to do something very special for this moth. Right, you've already seen that slide before. Um, but it's brilliant. This, this goes into a little bit of habitat creation enhancement um, in urban areas. Um, uh, Mark gave you the figures on how much urban grassland there is cut, but urban grassland is, there's a lot of it, and it gets cut an awful lot of times. I don't know how many times around this part of the world, but when we were cutting, we were certainly cutting six, seven times a year at least. We used to cut 18 times a year in Dorset, and then the budgets were slashed, and it was down to 12, and then down to six. Understanding the grassland ecosystem is really important because if you can stop that grass growing in the first place, then maybe you don't even have to cut six times a year. So in Dorset, in urban areas, wherever we can, we've moved on to cut and collect as the means of managing those grasslands. Because if you can whip away that fertility during the growing season, it will never come back. And as you know, if you whip away the fertility, you open up the ground for more germination, which increases your biodiversity. So that's, that's what's happened. And one of the nice ways of doing this is to take an existing verge and to go and hit it really hard one year. So I'm talking about three cut and collects in one year. So let the grass grow into mid-April and go and swipe it, take it away. Do the same again in July and again in September. And what happens the following year? Well, that's what happens the following year. The main sway there is that's in May, the following year. No cutting required at all. That would normally have been cut six times a year. But after three harsh cut and collects during the first season, it's then going, don't really need it. There's no safety issue there. There's nothing wrong with that. And what you've changed is an awful lot of coarse grasses, and you've changed it to a mix of coarse and fine grasses, and oh, a load more daisies. Lovely. Um, but it's the principle that enables you to save money and deliver more biodiversity. And just a bit further down that road, what we did at the end of that first year was just to introduce some wildflowers. So here's a couple of really dull bits of triangular grassland, of which there are tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands across the country, that just get gang mown. What a waste of time and money that is. So on those ones where we've tried this, we've done that three harsh cut and collects in one year, and then sowed a simple mix of wildflowers. Just some oxide daisy, bit of common knapweed, common bird's foot trefoil, and some yellow rattle, and just left it go. 18 months later, what were boring bits of mown grassland have become mini nature reserves in the urban area. What could be simpler than that? And I think that's the sort of approach that we ought to be taking wherever we can. Cut and collect machines are more, much more expensive than, than standard ride-on mowers, and we have to deal with the issue of disposal of the arisings. Questions after on that. It's not easy, but the, but the point is we can save money as well as deliver more biodiversity through this route. Right, so there are my conclusions. Well, that's it, really. If you think of urban grassland as an ecosystem, those amenity grasslands that just get gangmo, if you think of it as an ecosystem, you can take control of the amount that the grass is growing. And low fertility is key to that, in particularly in terms of increasing the wildflowers. And I say that the, actually creating grasslands full of wildflowers is really easy to do. We need to incorporate low fertility into all of our scheme designs in order to get that best effect. And changes to verge management, in my view, are possible on any class of road. That is possible in urban, it's possible in rural, on the C and D class roads, and on the A and Bs, and on the trunk 
and motorway networks. And we just have to look for those opportunities. Now, cut and collect, that's a whole different kind of you know, lecture, you know, story to tell on cut and collect. But uh, we've managed it in Dorset without challenge. And Cut and Collect's now been operational since 2014. We're now into 2020. The county, well, what was the county council, now Dorset Council, has invested last year in three new machines to do Cut and Collect. So it is convinced that this is a very important way of saving money and delivering biodiversity. And as always, working with the grain of nature saves time and money. Thank you.